Hello everyone, welcome to the PhD Perspective webinar. My name is Michal Gallagher, I'm the Community Engagement Executive with Engineers Ireland. Um, it's an absolute delight to have so many people uh, live with us uh, here this evening. Um, just to give you an idea of tonight's uh, webinar, we have three fantastic um, PhD graduates who will be giving their, us their perspective on uh, what the PhD meant um, and uh, in terms of their own uh, career. Before we do so, I just want to flag um, that many students um, and graduates and of people joining us today. And um, I noticed there were a lot of final year students and many of you have taken up the graduate rate, the graduate transfer rate, that's great to see. For those of you who haven't, I just want to flag that there's a fantastic opportunity there to save 700 euro um, in the next four years. Um, it's what a lot of uh, people do when they complete their college year in Ireland, so I really strongly um, recommend it. For those of you who are on PhDs, we have a special PhD rate of um, 65 euro per year, um, so you can have uh, your entire PhD uh, over the course of four years. It would only cost you 260 euro membership for those four years, so it's definitely worthwhile uh, checking out and investigating. Um, you can do so on your membership profile on your mobile phone, it's very easy to do and um, it could be something to consider doing this evening after the webinar. Um, so yeah, our webinar speakers uh, this evening, we're, we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Gemma Kremen, who is a research fellow in Earthquake Engineering, University College London. Dr. Richard Manton, who is the Deputy Registrar of Engineers Ireland and the Policy Officer, and as well as Dr. James Ryle, uh, Systems Engineer um, and a Senior Specialist at Eton. Um, as well as Chartered Engineer of the Year finalist uh, for 2020. So three uh, distinguished speakers. I'm going to hand it over shortly uh, to Gemma, our first uh, speaker, um, but by way of giving a bit more of a developed instruction for Gemma. Um, Gemma is developing statistical tools to support decision making related to seismic activity. Her research interests include seismic hazard characterization, probabilistic seismic risk analysis and disaster resilience. She was previously a research associate in ge geophysics at the University of Bristol, where she worked on improving understanding of seismic hazard and risk associated with shale gas development in the United Kingdom. She recently completed um, her PhD in earthquake engineering at Stanford University under the supervision of Professor Jack Baker. Her doctoral research involved using various statistical techniques to benchmark, validate, and improve loss predictions of performance-based earthquake engineering assessment procedures. Findings from this research can be found in five journal papers. Gemma has degrees in civil engineering from Stanford University, um, which, as I said, her PhD was from, and uh, University College Cork um, from 2014, where she uh, placed in first place. She has she also has related uh, professional experience in Atkins um, and her awards include the Stanford Graduate Fellowship, the John A. Bloom Research, Research Fellowship and the Uver University College Cork Science and Engineering Graduate of the Year Gold Medal. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Gemma. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and allow you to share your screen, Gemma. And Gemma, I think you're on mute. This is the characteristic uh, quote from 2020. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, thanks, Michal. Um, uh, okay, so uh, I'll just get my um, uh, presentation. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Um, so as Michal said, um, I'm Gemma, uh, and I'm working at UCL at the moment in London. Um, so just firstly, a little bit of background on me. Um, so as Michal said, I graduated from UCC with um, a civil engineering degree in 2014. Um, and as part of this degree, I spent a year abroad, so the third year of the degree um, in California, at University of California, Irvine. And then um, I went on after my bachelor's to do a master's in structural engineering at Stanford, and then I followed that with a PhD um, in 2019. So firstly, um, what influenced my PhD decision? So this is something that Michal uh, kind of suggested answering, um, but I think there's a lot of uh, material which is packed into this question. So I tried to tackle it in three different ways. So firstly, the PhD degree itself. Um, 
So for me, um, the final year project in, in the final year of undergrad was by far my favorite part of that year. Um, so I, I never had any problem spending time doing the research for that project. Um, and because of that, I kind of realized I really like research and therefore I kind of thought, you know, doing a PhD is a, is a good kind of route for me to follow. Um, a second thing is that, um, especially in engineering, when you're doing a PhD degree, um, you're going to be solving problems, uh, solving new problems generally. And so you really want to have a good love of problem solving, which I did. And um, finally, um, a love of discovering new things. And so, you know, in a kind of conventional um, consulting engineering job, let's say, um, you might spend a lot of time uh, applying methods um, that have been developed before to new situations. And generally though, in a PhD, you're, you're actually developing those methods um, yourself. So I, I really enjoyed that, that idea. Um, and that's kind of why I wanted to do a PhD. Um, so in terms of the topic, um, so the topic of a PhD is very important and I'll talk a bit, about, a bit more about that in a minute. But um, firstly, I decided uh, on earthquake engineering because, um, so I never heard of earthquake engineering before I, I spent my year in California. Um, and it's completely, it was completely different to anything we studied during undergrad and that kind of appealed to me because, um, you know, it was something different, um, it was exciting and, uh, you know, it's, it's really kind of an important aspect of engineering when you live in somewhere like California that gets exposed to earthquakes all the time. Um, and another important aspect of this topic, which I really liked, was the fact that I could kind of marry my love of engineering with my love of maths. Um, so I was able to combine engineering with statistics in my research and that's something I think that's important about doing a PhD as well is that you don't have to do something that's completely in engineering. Um, I, I did a lot of statistics on my PhD and I learned a lot of, of the statistics during my PhD. And um, so you're not limited by what you did in undergrad in terms of what you can do in your PhD, I would say. Um, and finally, um, the location, and I think that's something that's also really important when you're thinking about doing a PhD. Um, so I chose Stanford because um, there's world-class earthquake engineering researchers there, so I knew I would have a good experience in the topic I wanted to pursue. Um, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to go there, uh, plus living expenses, so that made the decision much easier, obviously. Um, it's hard to go to another country like that if, if you're not supported financially. And uh, of course, it was California, so the weather was quite nice. Um, so kind of based on, on those kind of three areas, um, there are important things to keep in mind about doing a PhD. Firstly, um, I think a common misconception about doing a PhD is that uh, it's all about kind of the intellectual effort involved. Um, and that's kind of the hardest thing. Um, for me, that definitely wasn't the case. I think a lot of people are capable of doing a PhD. Um, yeah, you're solving new problems, um, but you get a lot of guidance on the way and uh, you, know, you don't have to achieve a major thing in a day or anything, like it takes a couple of years um, to do it. The, the thing for me that I think is the most important thing if, if you're thinking about doing a PhD is the idea of perseverance. Um, so it's, you know, you spend a lot of your life doing a PhD, actually, around four years, um, devoted to one research project. Um, so you need to kind of keep yourself motivated for those four years. Um, and uh, another thing that um, is kind of difficult in terms of persevering through a PhD is the fact that your day-to-day -day life is much less structured than um, if you were in a typical job. Um, so, you know, there's nobody there at, you know, nine o'clock in the morning telling you to go to work, for instance, you can work whenever you want. Um, and that can cause, you know, a lot of problems um, if, if you're not kind of self-disciplined enough to, to do the research when, when it needs to be done. Um, another issue kind of with perseverance is the fact that there's not always um, kind of like a clear path to success, let's say. Uh, so it's not like, you know, every week you'll achieve something great in your PhD. You definitely won't. Uh, you mightn't even achieve something great every month. It might be, you know, once a year or even 
uh, once every two years, it, even to kind of write like a 10 page paper in your PhD might require 18 to 24 months of, of doing research. So um, it, it's very kind of difficult sometimes to see whether you're progressing or not. And finally, you'll experience many setbacks along the way because you know, you're, you're trying to solve problems that nobody's ever solved before. And there's definitely going to be times, you know, when your code isn't working, for example, um, or you, you, you think you, you do an experiment, you think it's going to turn out one way, it turns out completely the opposite way. And you need to keep yourself motivated throughout those whole processes. Um, so looking back on my PhD, uh, what I thought were kind of essential um, ingredients to, to help you persevere throughout was firstly having a well-selected topic, secondly having a well-selected supervisor, and thirdly having a good work-life balance. And um, so in terms of selecting a topic, you know, if you, if you think you want to do a PhD, you need to choose a topic that you're passionate about. So you're going to spend, you know, around four years of your life researching this topic. You want to be interested in it um, or else the whole process will become so much more difficult. Um, secondly, choosing a, a PhD supervisor is, essential, is really, really vital. And um, so that will, may determine whether or not you actually finish your, your degree, the relationship you have with your supervisor. And um, so I would say, you know, if you're looking around for kind of ads on, on doing PhDs, don't just jump at one because you like the topic. And um, look at who the supervisor is. Do they have previous experience in that topic? Um, maybe email some of their previous students, see how they got along with that supervisor. Um, uh, make sure that they kind of have your best interests at heart, that they you know, really want you to succeed in a PhD and that will help your journey a lot. And, and thirdly, um, it's essential to have a good work-life balance, I think. So try to keep a daily schedule and also you, know, you want to keep up your hobbies outside of work as well. That will help you get through. So just a quick few notes on doing a PhD in the USA, because that's where I have experience of doing one. Um, so firstly, uh, there's usually kind of three main uh, pieces to your application. Firstly, you need letters of recommendation, and they're crucial. And um, so they might determine whether or not your, your application kind of gets read in full or not. So, um, you know, in order to get good letters of recommendation, you obviously need to be doing well in your courses and stuff, but you also need to keep up kind of good relationships with your lecturers so they get to know you and they can write you a good letter of recommendation. Um, something that may be different to Ireland is the fact that you have to write a statement of purpose, which is kind of, you know, showing them that you want to do a PhD and you've kind of done some research on your topic and some research on the institution you're applying to. And finally, obviously, there's an important set on your academic record. Um, so application deadlines can be quite early in the year. So that's something to keep in mind, especially if you want to go next year. Um, they're usually funded by the host institution, which, which is good. Um, but you can be an, a more attractive candidate if you come with your own funding. So they might be more inclined to give you a space. Um, another thing to keep in mind about PhDs in the USA is that they tend to last longer than those in Ireland. So they last around five years, and that's because you need to do courses as well as just doing research, even if you have a master's degree. Um, and, and the thing that happens in America is, uh, you know, they they give you the funding um, for the entire duration of your PhD. It doesn't matter how long it takes. They'll, they'll throw money at you, which is, which is great, but you know, then it, it can last as long as basically you want it to last. And finally, for more information, I would say um, places that I went to during my application process was the university's international office, for instance. They were very helpful. Um, talk to your lecturers, see if other people have gone uh, to the USA before and if they did like how do they get on um, and also so there are funding opportunities to do PhDs in the USA and you can get funded you know from Irish sources like Fulbright for example so I remember when I was applying there uh, to, to USA I, uh, I went to those kind of seminars in the university and, and those people who kind of run those seminars will know all about the application process as well so they can be very helpful gu guiders and to your application so if anybody if you have any kind of more specific questions, I'd be very happy to take them obviously on that, but that's just kind of a brief overview of uh, those types of PhDs. And um, so in terms of the next step after PhD, uh, I chose the academic route, which typically consists of 
doing a PhD, doing around four or five years, it depends, of postdoctoral research work, and then hopefully you'll end up being a lecturer one day. Um, so I'm kind of in the middle of, of this part of my career progression. So I started out at the University of Bristol last year, um, and now I'm at UCL. And uh, I chose roots for kind of obvious reasons, really. Um, I really enjoy research. I also really enjoy teaching, so I've got exposed to that side of it. Um, and, and that's crucial if you want to be a lecturer, obviously. And then I, I really like working in a, in a university environment. I think uh, it's a good, good place to work and collaborate. And um, so that's why I chose that particular route. So finally, some parting words um, and kind of reasons why or why not you should choose to pursue a PhD. So I think in, in summary, you should choose to pursue a PhD if you're passionate about a certain topic and you want to spend four years of your life working on that topic, you know you have enough self-discipline to motivate yourself when things are going well, but more importantly, when things are not, because that's, the, that's when the difficulties come. And you know we've all experienced it as researchers when things aren't going well and you don't know why and you just need to keep on trying. Um, and another important aspect is obviously you're, you're comfortable with a less structured working environment where you know, you're your own boss really. And from day to day, you might have weekly meetings with your supervisor, but really you're the one who's motivating yourself every day to do the work. Um, and I also put here some reasons why you shouldn't necessarily choose to do a PhD or you know, exclusively only for these reasons. Firstly, it's a uh, kind of obvious one is you know, because you, you did really well in your undergrad and you think, okay, doing a PhD is a nat natural next step. Um, I don't. I don't think it is. Like I said, uh, it's not just about intellectual capacity. It's also about your ability to persevere. Um, and there's a lots of other great opportunities that you can have, that are equally as challenging as a PhD. If you, if you don't if you don't choose to pursue one, um, you're having difficulty finding a job, and you think, okay, PhD is a reasonable substitute. In my opinion, it isn't because, as I said, it's you know it's a completely different working environment. Um, and it, you know, you can be working really on sociable hours sometimes. And um, so if that's okay for you, then okay, but it's not directly a substitute for a job, I would say. Uh, and finally, uh, don't choose a PhD because you think you're gonna make more money because you may not. Uh, I definitely didn't. Uh, in, so that's just my personal experience. I think I would have earned more money if I did do a PhD, to be honest. Um, so yeah, so those are kind of my, my thoughts on, on doing a PhD. If you have any more questions, obviously you can ask them at the end. Um, I put my email there as well on my website and don't hesitate to uh, to me. I'd be delighted to take any, any that you have. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Gemma. And I think that even particularly in um, that final side, there is so much that the um, so many kind of failures or people who are considering PhDs who are asking me questions on a regular basis. Like you're just addressing like so many of the core issues there. So I really appreciate that talk and um, your kind of candor and talking about your own career. It's really greatly appreciated. Uh, to introduce our next uh, speaker, um, no problem. We uh, thank you. Um, so everyone, hang around for the Q and A. That's going to be at the end. But to introduce our next speaker. Um, we didn't need to go too far to find the speaker. Uh, Dr. Richard Manton works with Engineers Ireland. He is a senior manage manager uh, with responsibilities in policy, public affairs and academic standards. He is also a non-executive director of Bus Aaron, providing strategic direction to the state bus company. Um, he's previously a researcher and lecturer in transport, energy and environment at NUIG. He has a PhD in civil engineering on the topic of planning and design of infrastructure for walking and cycling. Over to you, Richard. Thanks, Michal. Um, I suppose just to, to start with a maybe stereotypical cartoon from the PhD comic, which I'd highly recommend in terms of if you wanted to get a flavor for maybe, or an exaggerated flavor of the life of a beleaguered set of PhD students. I do think it touches on um, some of the topics that Gemma mentioned and that I wanted to, to tease out in this presentation, which is what exactly are you qualified to do after a PhD? But there is sometimes the presumption that a PhD only qualifies you to go into academia and that there's almost a fear that you might be overqualified for other jobs. But I suppose one of the things that I want to uh, touch on through my own experience and then some more generalized 
points is that PhD can open up a lot of avenues that you develop skills that can be applied to other areas and that while it can be quite tough, it can be quite an enjoyable experience as well. So just in, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll just go through sort of my own perspective on reasons to do a PhD, some of the challenges as well, just touching on research, funding and supervisor. I think some of the things that you should try to embrace as well if you do go on to do a PhD, such as applying your research in context, embracing travel opportunities, um, applying for awards and bursaries, and uh, just some reflections then on potential future career um, possibilities. In terms of my own uh, career trajectory that I graduated from NUIG in civil engineering in 2010, went on to do a PhD for spent four years full-time, then took me another year part-time. Um, I worked as a postdoc and did some teaching for about two and a half years. And then I came to work in Engineers Ireland about three and a half years ago. Uh, my current role is Deputy Registrar and Policy Officer. I might touch on a few of these things towards the end. That generally involves some research, some policy development and engagement, and then um, our accreditation process for higher education engineering programs in Ireland. So I won't go into too much detail about my own specific research. I don't think that's really the, the scope of this uh, presentation, but really just to give you a flavor but as we all mentioned, um, my research topic was planning and design of walking and cycling infrastructure. So just the context of that was in 2009, that there was really a, a shift in government policy, partly as a result of the, the Green Party being in government at that time, towards embracing more sustainable travel patterns, and that in particular to encourage more people to, to walk and cycle. One of the, the main impediments, of course, to people cycling is um, either direct or perceived safety concerns and that engineering and the design of infrastructure, the planning of urban and rural areas has a major role to play in terms of increasing the numbers of people walking and cycling. So that was really the context of my own PhD that we got funding from the Department of Transport to run a project in terms of developing planning and design guidelines for greenways which are off-road walking and cycling paths, and then to do, do some other work on urban walking and cycling. So just you'd see in some of the, the images there, for example, on the top left is uh, just a mapping extract of, of my case study route was developing a greenway between Galway and Dublin, which has uh, been caught up in some planning challenges itself. But you'll just see there, that um, by using, say, various uh, mapping techniques, they can plot out a route, you can, say, set out a corridor, and then you can try to better understand the population catchments, the natural and physical constraints, and other potential impediments to the planning and design of the route. So for me, a lot of this was, was my own interest in walking and cycling, but also uh, environmental issues more broadly. And I do think if you are interested in, air, in an area, and often you may start interested and become even more passionate as well, on, but in that way, uh, your, your research uh, that bit uh, easy. So as well, just some of the other things shown there then is just looking at how exactly these routes are built. So you see there in the top right is from the Mayo Greenway, the bottom right is from the West Mead Greenway. So we looked at the kind of materials that go into it, how exactly they're constructed and so on. And then the bottom left is a project uh, I did over in Berkeley, uh, just in terms of urban walking and cycling and the overlaps with traffic density and pedestrian crime and so on. So that's just really to give you a background flavour of my own research. Um, I think within interest in a research area is probably one of the most important thing. I would fully agree with uh, Gemma's point in terms of it's not just an issue of intellectual capability, but it is an issue of maybe starting with interest of this perseverance and of course ultimately you do want to make a contribution to research or to knowledge to society more broadly. So on to funding which I think is probably one of the most uh, uh, difficult issues in terms of doing a PhD. My own background was that as I mentioned we got funding, my supervisor got funding from the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport then hired me as a PhD student we then got further funding to complete the project from NUI Galway. Uh, many of you will have those internal funding opportunities that you'll see come up and may be affiliated to a supervisor who you may or may not 
know through to your department or may be advertised on a university website. Um, I went on to do two postdocs. One of those is funded by the EPA. The second one is from SFI. Again, those are two quite good funding sources that you could look at that offer both PhD funding along with uh, postdoc funding. But again, I would agree with Gemma's points that um, being able to associate yourself with the supervisor, whether that's through building a relationship with them through your own institution or that they may advertise a PhD position, that there are important things to consider there in terms of their own research profile and uh, what exactly uh, kind of research you would be doing with them. Um, I'd just like to make a few points as well about some of the things that might happen on the fringes of your research or what I call applying your research in context and being able to uh, collaborate with other ongoing projects. So for example, I had a fairly good relationship with Galway City Council as well as the NUIG Buildings Office, which then opened up the potential to work with them on some walking and cycling related projects that, that they were doing. And then as I went on to do some teaching as possible for my students then in turn to get involved in projects. So just on the left there was a parklet that we installed in Woodkey that you'd think for something so small as that, essentially a bench and some uh, potted plants, that actually the level of community engagement that would go into say removing two parking spaces, working with local businesses, with communities, to ultimately put in some kind of resource. I think for me it was quite a learning experience in terms of engineering, not just being an abstract or a very technical pursuit, but being completely connected to communities. Similarly, if you look at the top right, that was where we had a project run with Galway City Council. We closed off some streets for bus priority, for walking and cycling, and again, had students out doing uh, traffic counts. And again, to channel that back into the trial, that ultimately now I think has been progressed uh, through Galway City Council and then did quite a lot with the NUI Galway sustainability strategy. And again, it's quite good, say, particularly in an area like transport that is completely connected to sustainability and people's behaviour, to be able to apply your research in that kind of context, I think is quite rewarding, but also quite a learning experience. Um, I think travel in general is a, a major opportunity for uh, research that uh, in my own background that had the opportunity to go to UC Berkeley for a semester, that was that there was a scholarship uh, between the NUIs and the UCs. And then later on that I went to New in Munich for a semester as well. So I would say, as Gemma mentioned, keep an eye out for whether it is international research schemes that, that may be to do a PhD in an international university. Or maybe that if you do go on to do a PhD, that there are opportunities to travel. It could be for a conference, it could be for a research visit, it could be to audit um, a module abroad. But I do think not only will that enrich your own research in terms of your building out your network, me sharing ideas with others, but also as well, I do think it will be of benefit to your own institution as well if you can uh, build those relationships. Um, on then to I suppose research awards and bursaries that there are quite a lot of opportunities to build up your own career, build recognition for both your research and yourself as a researcher. So I was fortunate enough to win um, an award, the Environmental Researcher of the Year Award. Again that was quite useful not just for me personally to build up the profile of my own research in uh, walking and cycling and the potential benefits of greenways. As well when you go to so many of these conferences, there'll be often these opportunities for best paper, best presentation, that kind of thing, which again builds up your own recognition and might as well provide uh, some much needed uh, funding for you. So then just in, in my last few minutes, just wanted to make a few points about applying research skills potentially outside academia. That, of course, PhDs aren't for everyone and a career in academia isn't for everyone but that you aren't just, let's say, constricted to that uh, career path. So uh, when I mentioned that, uh, there's nothing wrong, I think, with a career in academia, but it may not suit some people in terms of the, the type of career it presents, certain pressures in terms of work-life balance, uh, certain public, uh, publish or perish issue, and so on. But I do think, particularly with engineering PhDs, that there is a, a much broader, I think, uh, scope for uh, career development. 
So just looking at these statistics from the HEA, there are uh, just over 8,000 PhD enrollments, 14% of those are in engineering. And while for the average PhD graduate, 65% uh, uh, work in non-market areas, most of those being in higher education, that for engineering PhD graduates, it's about one third work in the non-market, so in terms of higher education, civil service and so on. And actually that you see about 30% work in manufacturing alone. So there are quite a lot of different career paths there for engineering PhD graduates. And again, that while there isn't anything particularly wrong with building a career in academia, just that there are many different career paths open to you if you do go on to do a PhD. So for example, in my own case, coming to work for Engineers Ireland, that it was quite possible for me to apply my research skills that I had developed throughout a PhD to then write on reports like the State of Ireland report, which we released recently, which is our recommendations on a policy and advocacy, or some of our other reports and publications that, again, are based on research engagement. And I think a PhD does set you up excellently for applying research skills in some other different job roles. I think another major benefit of a PhD that you can apply um, outside academia is the broader sectoral knowledge that you build up. So in my own case, that was uh, developing a knowledge of the transport sector that I'd um, apply and work that I do with bus air and some other areas, as well as then the broader engineering education area, which you develop in terms of traveling, doing some teaching, demonstrating and so on. And I would definitely apply that in my own work in uh, the accreditation of engineering education. So again, other people have different examples. It may be if you do a PhD in chemical engineering, you get to better understand the pharmaceutical sector, you might may do it in construction and again get to know the broader construction sector. So while you will have your own very specific research question, you do learn an awful lot, you get to meet a lot of people through the very fact of doing a PhD. So this was in summary, I think for me the most important thing was my own interest both in research as an activity and my own research area which is walking and cycling. But there are some important enablers there in terms of be getting funding, um, uh, affiliating to a good supervisor that will say, um, look after you and we will, be, will, will be well recognized in their field. I think as well that a PhD offers um, brilliant opportunities in terms of community engagement, applying your research and context and opportunities then related to travel, applying for awards and so on. And that there are many different career paths that, that you could um, develop in terms of applying your research or getting involved in your sector more broadly. So just coming back to that cartoon, that there are many different paths open to you, that you can go into academia, or particularly for an engineering PhD, that you could uh, apply your research skills in many different sectors. So, thanks. That was fantastic, and thank you so much, uh, Richard. And um, like it, I must say that, Speaking as someone who works with you and while I'm on the road engaging with people who are either like in higher education or in industry, um, the, the the various like reports and uh, policies that you produce are often like widely referenced and used in a very practical way. So that's like everything you said there was uh, really fantastic and thank you for that. And I have the great pleasure now of introducing our final speaker uh, for the evening. Um, and um, I will, uh, as James prepares his slideshow, I might just read out his bio uh, here. Uh, James graduated with a bachelor's degree in electronic engineering and went on to perform research leading to a PhD degree from UCD. His doctoral research focused on advancing digital holographic imaging systems and also, develop, and also developing speckle, speckle metrology systems to measure biophysical signals of brain stem activity. Shortly after his PhD, he designed the initial technology used in a successful university spinner company. He held a postdoctoral fellowship at Maynooth University and was a visiting scientist at uh, TUI in Germany. He returned to UCD where he was awarded an innovation prize to perform early stage technical and market feasibility for some of his earlier work. He has collaborated with and been funded by research performing organizations and applied research wings of multinational corporations to advance their technology offering and product development. In 2019, he joined Eaton Corporation's Centre for Intelligent Power as a senior specialist. 
Here, he contributes to industrial machine vision research projects, investigates emerging technologies, and identifies collaboration opportunities for the center. Dr. Ryle has authored or co-authored over 40 publications and has contributed to a number of inventions. He holds chartered engineer status with Engineers Ireland and is a lifetime member of the Society for Optics and Photonics Technology, while also being an ordinary member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers as well as being the 2020 uh, finalist for Chartered Engineer 2020. James, over to you. Thank you, Michal. Can you hear me all right there? I have to warn you, my computer is about to crash. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see my screen there, and uh, I'm here to talk about my uh, perspective of the PhD. Um, you've frozen on me, but is everything all right on your side? Yay or nay, Michal. Yay. Grand stuff. Well, so thank you for that, that introduction. Um, uh, so a bit about me. I'm a senior specialist at Eaton Center for Intelligent Power. Now, my PowerPoint has just quit. So, uh, no. Nope. Uh, nothing like a bit of technical issues. Um, so as, as Michal said there, I work on vision analytics, a number of projects. Um, combining machine learning, deep learning uh, elements to my background, which is in optical engineering. Um, one of the projects we did was uh, having social distancing ready on, the, on a system in India within two weeks of COVID pandemic hitting us. I also work with aerospace. Um, we do a number of things there where we look at the minute changes in the electrical signal um, of Sorry, this is going everywhere. Do you mind if I just quit? Um, I'll force PowerPoint to quit and I'll open it again. Sorry, it's got 16 gigabytes of, of memory being used. <laughs> That's no problem at all. And these are the parts of the uh, recording that get edited out, so not to worry. Exactly. So, so here, let me pop this back up. I think it's an update uh, issue. I haven't turned this computer on and off in, in a while. But no, so one of those three things was government engagements. And one of those things that's quite handy is having that PhD in the background because it gives you credibility when you discuss with people what uh, are the technical uh, oversights required for projects. And when you can make a good businessman out of an engineer, you might not be able to make a good engineer out of a businessman or business person. Um, so uh, just just bear that in mind. So I've always like like all the panelists here. I've always loved um, <clears throat> engineering, how things work. Uh, so I think I've got this here. It should be opening up. I've always loved how things work. And one of those slides that I had there was a picture of lots of cars and um, and things. But one of them was a car that was crashed into a wall. And the, at the age of three. I really want to look after a car and how it works. So I found out how the handbrake works of a car by accident and the car went down a hill, smashed into a, uh, a wall. And, you know, I learned non-destructive test, well, actually destructive testing. Um, and that probably started me on the journey of uh, non-destructive testing later on. Now, Gemma spoke about statistical significance. Um, so the problem with this is, how do you know something's right? Well, do it again. So at, by the age of five, I had crashed another car in the same circumstances. So my parents had built a wall there. And um, this PowerPoint isn't coming up just yet, but I'll talk about that anyway. So why did I do a PhD? I was going to show you a timeline of my career. So I did the BE in electronic engineering in UCD. Um, I wasn't very happy with the mark that I received at the end of the day. There was some circumstances leading leading up to that um, person's circumstances. So I went to my PhD supervisor, what turned out to be my PhD supervisor, and he said to me, uh, as I was asking, I want to do a master's to correct for the bad mark, which was not reflective of my ability. Um, would you recommend doing a master's? And he said, James, I've got nothing to offer you. Um, and my response to him was, that's all right, Sean. Truth be told, uh, your research doesn't float my boat. It's not the appropriate thing to say to your former or PhD supervisor or your future PhD supervisor. But two days later, he rang me up and said, actually, there's a project you might be interested in. And so I started doing a project, a uh, master's project, just to see how things would go. 
on two areas, one looking at imaging, different uh, diffractive imaging, 3D imaging, and one as a biomedical device looking at uh, minute movement of the human eye. So building the components around that, testing the system and making it really work. And um, so that's what I did. And would you believe that nothing is coming up on the PowerPoint yet? So we'll just go PowerPointless. Uh, so that's all right. This is uh, <laughs> one thing we've got to do. So I did the PhD and I started off and actually in third year or second year of the PhD, uh, I unfortunately got a little bit ill. So I nearly died. Um, so there's nothing like a bit of death to drive you what matters. Um, I, I did that after the PhD. I took some time off to do some traveling to work on a number of postdocs. Um, I helped set up a uh, do the technology for a spin out from the university, which is Ekbloom, putting lights on a horse's eye to make the horse uh, increase their reproductive uh, efficiency. So that 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 happened. Then I took a postdoc. Um, in Maynooth University for two years looking at um, 3D imaging of biopharmaceuticals. So looking at, trying to look at cells growing in a pharmaceutical or, um, environment. And after that, I took some time to do a bit of innovation, a bit of startup, looking at a med tech device and scoping out the market feasibility. Is this applicable? Um, and it's an invention. Um, so after about a year doing that, I needed food up to be put on the table. So I moved away from that and into a lecturing position uh, in UCD for a year to cover um, lectures for lecturers who've gone on sabbatical um, at your own expense. Here's me having a few needles is poked into my eye to measure my very small vibrations of the human eye to see if my brainstem was active. It quite clearly was. I worked on a horse project with the lights to make the horses have I essentially worked in the equine sex industry. We won prizes. I met literally the, the man who wrote the book on lasers, Tony Siegman, and I got to pose for a few photos, corporate photos and award photos, uh, flexing the ego. But it was the BE, the PhD, the postdoc, Equilum, IBAM, and then lecturing. This point in my career was an interesting one. And after the PhD, you can do a lot of things. You can work, go towards the academic side. You can go towards the applied research side. I liked everything, so I did a bit of both. Um, so my career is a bit of a mess at this, this point. I worked for a number of companies through the university or through another company. So my career was split 60%, 40% on some instances. I helped set up a startup, a number of startups, um, and then I moved to my current job. One of the interesting projects is you've got this really groundbreaking knowledge. Um, and the give, broad overview of this slide is, You've got an out of focus image and by applying mad, crazy equations, you can get an in focus image um, which can add value and impact to a problem you're solving. That's essentially what the PhD allows you to. It allows you to perform independent research um, that is above, above the level that's required uh, for conventional engineering. Um, so here we have uh, extended depth of focus. I extended depth of focus by 100 times the expected. I also worked with Intel to make the fastest reconstruction uh, of, of, of this imaging technique uh, in the world. It's the record still holds, which is actually a nice achievement. And you'll have those achievements uh, throughout your career, and they're, they're, they're pretty nice uh, to, to have. Especially when you bring the price from microscopes down from 2000 to the prototype to 200 uh, euro. Um, and you can bring that prototype price further down to five, five dollars or five euro. Um, so it can be spent out around the whole world looking at malaria, looking at blood samples in economies that don't have the funds to be able to pay for such large uh, laboratory equipment. And the value that you're bringing here is by the algorithms which are based on the pure scientific research that you've performed in the PhD. So what is the PhD? It's enabled to do self-directed research. You write your papers, you get them out. You, you're, they're required. That's how you're, you're marked on your PhD is your viva. So you've got the scientific research. And from my perspective, the industrial applied research perspective, you apply that science theoretical basis um, to the just domain specific or industry needs. And that's where you get the commercial value out there. The, the impact patents are one, one, one examples of what that is. So you might ask, well, what does that mean? You've spoken a lot, you've had a computer crash. What does this mean to you, everybody on this call? If you're thinking about a PhD, and a PhD is not for everybody, it is for some, but if you have that mental resilience, go for it. 
focus on the research. Are you going to have enough money to pay for that? In Ireland, there are scholarships available, but if you are offered a PhD, an unfunded PhD, I wouldn't take that. You need to put money or food on the table and that money is used for food. Um, it also, if you have a good scholarship, you will not have to demonstrate as much or invigilate as much to earn money on that front. One key thing is people. Um, Gemma and, and Patrick, I think, mentioned about keeping up your life, work-life balance. Work with good people and an established group. If you are starting off with a brand new PhD supervisor, if the overheads aren't there to say, build something, if you're experimental like I was, if you have to build circuits that uh, are very basic, but they don't contribute to science, it's uh, not a waste of your time, but it's a, it's a huge learning process. It's not an effective use of your time. And make sure you work with good peers, your supervisor. In Germany, they have the expression of the Dr. Vater. So your PhD supervisor essentially becomes your, uh, your Dr. Vater, your father of your PhD, your doctorate, um, or your doctor mother. Um, and then the project, this is key. Are you going to add to science? You report out in papers, you publish it, and it's peer review. Um, is it aligned with career expectations? Gemma mentioned about the academic route. Uh, Patrick mentioned about the policy route. I'm talking here about the industrial route. And then the Viva is based on your research findings. Are you adding to science? So key thing, anyone can do a PhD, resilient. And the three words that always come to mind for me are, are you curious about the project? Do you have the confidence to approach that topic and apply a really creative solutions? That in my mind, is what makes it not feel like work at all, it's just enjoyment. Um, and then before I take too long, uh, before the computer crashes again, uh, remember these words, like keep interested in your own career, however humble. If you don't want to do a PhD, it's not the end all. If you don't want to do anything, it's not a problem, but it's a real possession in your changing fortune time. So if you're happy to do what is perceived as the most lowliest job and you're happy, that is all that matters. It's your happiness at, at the end of the day. So um, apologies about the technical uh, glitches. Um, I'll hand it back to you, Michal, and thank you, everybody, for your time. Well, thank you so 